because of the Vietnam War, I wanted to see if I could contribute to what we were trying to do. I didn't quite understand it. I was only 18 when I joined. But I wanted to contribute. I wanted to give back. To me, going to Vietnam was kind of like a job, an obligation. We have something to do, so that was it. I was the first aviator shot down over North Vietnam. Thus began my career as a prisoner of war. They sent me to Chulai, and I ended up in 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, as a platoon commander for Kilo Company. I'm a retired Army major. I went to the Vietnam as an enlisted woman. I was 19. If you're 26 years old and, uh, you know, and uh, you're enjoying life to the hilt, you know, and they're locked up for uh, eight and a half years, I would say, yeah, it's a hell of a maturing process. I was going to enlist in the Navy, but I went down in the basement of the post office, and there was a sign with a, a sailor that says, join the Navy, see the world, and said, yeah, that's what I want to do. And next to it, there was a poster with a Marine in his blues with a sword, and it said, be a leader of men, join the Marines. And my Spanish then kicked in and says, Navy is the Naval, which is Navy. Marines is the Marina, which is the Navy. So what's the difference between these two guys? Master Sergeant Bratkowski was coming out of his office, big Marine, tall, good looking, broad shoulders, ribbons from World War II in Korea. And he put his arm around me and says, how would you like to be one of us? <laughs> so here I went in the Marine Corps. <laughs> I had always wanted to go to college. And when I graduated from high school, I had an opportunity to go to Mexico City. I said, this is the opportunity that I need in order to strengthen my understanding of Spanish. I really enjoy learning languages because a language tells you not only what people say, but if you really look at it, it tells you about their culture, about their history, about how they think. I always uh, had a, um, a desire to fly. It's something that I wanted to do because it seemed to be a challenge. I remember all these kids that were older when we were growing up that would go and take an exam to be a naval cadet, and almost all of them flunked. They'd come back with, well, I, f I failed the written part. Well, I, f I failed the eye test. Well, I failed this. And these guys were all athletes and, <clears throat> and student leaders and what have you. And so I went and took the test of my senior year in college, and uh, there were fi about 55 college seniors taking it. And uh, at the end of the first day, uh, I was the only one left. And this young corporal who was grading the tests and so on, he looked at my paper and said, oh my God, if, if I had scores like that, I put in for electronics. I became a radio repairman. When I came back from Mexico, um, I went to the junior college there in, in Ventura County. The challenge just wasn't there like the challenge I had in Mexico City. My girlfriend told me, Laura, there is, a, there is a job fair coming up. We gotta go see what's available in our county. There was a whack sergeant, which I had never seen a woman in uniform before. She looked at me and says, have you ever thought of South Vietnamese? <laughs> well, no, not really. And he says, they get you into the language school, they'll take you into probably some area of military intelligence because that's where they will need the language capability. I graduated second in my class, and I went to Fort, uh, Fort Hollywood for interrogation training. One day, the, uh, my officer in charge called me, and there was a, a board meeting, and they said, says, Corporal Grisita, do you know what you're here for? And I said, no, sir. Says, take a guess. Says, Meritorious promotion, sir? And he smirked and smiled and said, ha, guess again. I said, a court martial, sir? I, I. <laughs> so he says, no, no. He says, we would like to know why you did not submit an application for 
the NISEP commissioning program, Wait. Naval Enlisted Scientific Education Program. And I said, sir, I, I don't qualify. He says, why don't you qualify? He says, I'm not a citizen. He says, where are you from? He says, sir, I'm from Mexico. He says, how long have you been in the Marine Corps? Says three years, sir. Says how long does it take to become a citizen? Says I don't know, sir. So says Gunny, call immigration, find out what are the re prerequisites. So he went back, came back, says, sir, talk to immigration. They said the prerequisites are five years residence in the U.S. or three years in the military. So my boss turned around, says. You got three years in the Marine Corps, you lived in the States three years, you're gonna to apply to become a citizen. We're gonna submit your application recommending you for this program. Next thing I know, I was on my way to the University of Idaho to get my degree. I earned my wings in November, uh, 61, as a naval aviator. I was uh, flying eight fours. I was on my second cruise off the uh, USS Constellation. August of uh, 1964, I was in the uh, very first raids into North Vietnam. The event was known as the Tonkin Gulf incident. You were in Vietnam? Were you a nurse? No, I was working in military intelligence. There were other <laughs> women in Vietnam. We became the invisible soldier. We did the things that, that helped keep our troops supplied with what they needed to survive. And trying to understand something of the psychology of the enemy, their structure, what their leadership is like. These are the kinds of things that we learned by reading those Vietnamese captured documents. We were uh, <clears throat> flying missions over Laos, primarily off of our ship, uh, escorting photo reconnaissance planes who would go up and down uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail uh, to, to take photographs of uh, what was being moved down from uh, North Vietnam through Laos to, to the south of Vietnam at the time. Many times while we were flying over missions over Laos, we'd brief and then cancel, brief and then cancel. Uh, this time the air group commander came in, I remember it was about local time, there was about 11.15 a.m. And uh, the uh, air group commander for our ship walked in and uh, he, uh, he said, this time we're not canceling, this is a go. Uh, President Johnson had just uh, went on the air to announce that we were attacking North Vietnam. We made a landing in Vietnam in 1965. And I went back and said, sir, I want to be dropped from the program. He says, why? He says, I want to go to war. I says, no, you, you're here for a four-year degree, so you have to stay. So I went and changed my major from electrical engineer to mathematics, graduated a year early, got commissioned, and went to basic school. They asked, any lieutenants have a choice of duty, any special regiment? And I said, yes, so I raised my hand, says, what, what regiment would you like to go to? Says, Fifth Marines, yeah, reputation, it's one of the best. I replaced a lieutenant who had been in country for a week and went on his first operation and got shot through the shoulder. I went on one operation to support artillery and took one of the platoons by the time I came back, the captain was gone. And there was only the other lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Bob Tilly. So Bob became the company commander, and by default, I became the executive officer. I had, what, three months in country. And here I am, the executive officer of the company. Two months later, uh, they kicked off Operation Union One in our new regimental commander, Colonel Houghton, Kenny Houghton, had given us a big speech on how he had been a lieutenant, he had been a captain and a major with the 5th Marines, and now that he was 
a regimental commander, we would be the roving battalion. March 67, we were heli lifted, we put everything in storage, they put us in helicopters and we went into Indian country. From the day we landed, we started having contact with the enemy. Two weeks later, I got shot in the head, went through my helmet. 45 minutes later, my eyes were purple and shot and I couldn't see. So they had to put me in a helicopter and send me back to the hospital. The next day, the other platoon commander got hit. That was the second time he got hit, so yeah, he went back. Uh, but a week later, the other new lieutenant got shot through the shoulder. Being a lieutenant was tough. It was just a revolving door. On 13 May, the company, well, the whole battalion run right into the enemy, the 2nd NVA Division in the Quezon Valley. And they had the big, big battle. Bob Tilly got shot through the stomach, took about three, four rounds of AK-47. Ten days after they shot me, when I came back to the company, it was, I was the company commander. So here I was in country five months, and I'm the company commander. I was coming back from, from uh, school, and um, I was walking in front of Third Field Hospital, and it just worked out that I was behind two other guys. Out of my peripheral vision, I saw two Vietnamese on a motorbike, of some sort of motorbike. And one had a pistol out like this. And he shot twice. The only thing I remember doing is hitting the, hitting the ground and thinking to myself, if I get killed, my mother's going to kill me. If I get killed, my mother's going to kill me. As we were going in uh, and uh, the first time, and all the way up, I kept thinking to myself, good God, we're going to war. This is war. I mean, we're going to go in and, and Hit a, hit a base. And I remember my knees shaking. Uh, I was, uh, it was all of that uh, apprehension. It really dawned on me, I am in a war zone. And there's danger here. Once I went in and everything started firing at me, et cetera, it was, and thereafter, it was every act, every action I, I took with regard to flipping switches and this and that. It was just sort of rote, you know? It was sort of like mechanically, oh, I gotta do this, smooth. I didn't feel any apprehension. I wasn't nervous. I wasn't, my knees were not shaking. It was just all motion and, and smoothness. Uh, especially when the tracers were coming by, coming by me when I was hit. My, my first thought was, oh God, uh, I, I better pull up and, and get some altitude, but immediately the smoke was coming out. Every warning light I had came on. I said to myself, if I stay with this, I'm not gonna make it. I'm not gonna live. I better get out now. Maybe I'll have a few broken bones or a bunch of whatever, but maybe I'll live. And so I pulled the ejection seat curtain overhead and I went out. Once I realized that I was, okay, that I was alive, and uh, then I started to have other thoughts. Uh, I remember immediately saying, oh God, my poor wife, my mom, what are they gonna do? Because I thought for sure I was gonna die if they caught me. Next thing I know is they pull up alongside me. They, they, were all, they all had rifles and one fellow had a revolver on this one little boat and there was another boat behind me and there was a fellow there with a hand grenade ready to pull a trick, pull a pin. And I, 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 I looked at him and I said, don't, don't, no, don't do that. And then a week later, after I was shot down, they, they uh, put me in the back of a vehicle and an officer accompanied me and took me to uh, Hanoi, where I was the first uh, American guest of what we later named the Hanoi Hilton. Talking about, <laughs> bad times in Vietnam. Yes, the thing that stood up before we went on Operation Union, they called us to exchange our weapons. And we had to turn in our M14s that our troops used. 
and they gave us the brand new M16. Once we went and got engaged in heavier combat, the weapons started malfunctioning. You come back from your operation, go to your troop, your line to see what happened, and you see someone with a rifle with a ramrod trying to clear it, and he's dead because he got shot while trying to clear the jam. So I went and turned in my 45 and took out an M16 just to carry it to show the troops that, hey, look, I got one. I'm not afraid of it. We'll go and do it. The Hanoi March, uh, July 6, 1966. They took uh, 52 American POWs and they marched us through the streets of Hanoi, beat the hell out of us. I, it's a miracle that nobody was killed that, that night. That's when the bad stuff started after that. They would, uh, the torture sessions for propaganda. I know that things were turning against the war. I know people were really uh, upset, again, at the cost of, of not only blood, but it was expensive. We spent a lot of money. And we took on a lot of responsibility that maybe really wasn't ours. People have become more conscious about all the death that comes in. I mean, we had 58,000 killed in Vietnam, uh, plus how many more on the enemy side. And that's why, you know, so. I came in through Travis and had to go to Oakland to get a plane down to Los Angeles, which that's had been, that is one of the most painful memories I had of the war. Um, I remember coming into Travis and, and I was wearing my uniform. Again, I'm very proud of what I did because I did it for my country. Uh, there were a group of protesters and of course they saw I was in uniform. And at first they said, are you a Girl Scout? I said, no, no, I'm in the military. Where are you coming from? I said, I came in, coming in from Vietnam. And then the harangue started. You're a baby killer. You supported the genocide of people. And it, it went on and on and on. I remember faces. I don't really remember what they said because it was just so painful to hear. And when I got spit on, I lost it. But I got away from them. I didn't say anything. I, you know, I got very quiet. I get, that's how I take care of those kind of situations. I get very quiet. They said, excuse me. I get with my way, went into the bathroom, changed my clothes. And that's the last time I traveled in uniform. When we went to Vietnam, we never questioned why are we going. We just, we blindly trusted our leadership, our president, our governors, our senators, congressmen, to be doing the things that were right for us. We never had the luxury of saying, well, wait a minute, let me see, why are we sending? We raised our hand and swore to uphold and defend the Constitution. You sent us to do a job. That's what we're here for. When we came back, we were told it was our fault because we should have said, no, hell no, go away. You can't do that. You can't do that. You have to follow your leadership. And when your leadership says, this is what you need to do, you do it. When I saw the Vietnam Memorial, I found it very moving. I just walked to one end and come back, my eyes start watering. I start crying. No reason. I didn't. I didn't mean to cry. I didn't think, but just walking down and looking at the names and thinking of what we had gone through and some of the names on the wall, some of my own troops. By the time I finished walking the wall, I was crying like a baby. And you touch the stone and you feel the darkness of the stone because we've lost so much. I definitely feel that I took away more than I invested in blood, sweat, tears. If you're in a position where all of a sudden you've lost your freedom as an individual and you come back from that, uh, uh, that experience, 
recognize that you've had that stripped. It, it, you really recognize that freedom is so sweet. <laughs>